As we prepare for the Lord's Supper, we'll be looking at a passage of scripture to, keep, to prepare our hearts to partake of the Lord's Supper in a manner pleasing to him. If you do not have a Bible, please raise your hand and men will hand you one. And if you don't own one, this is a gift for you to keep. We observe the Lord's Supper every Sunday in this church. On the last day that Jesus ate with his disciples, he took bread and he instituted this ordinance of the Lord's Supper and he said as he broke the bread, take this, my body, this is my body, which is for you, do this in remembrance of me. Then after the supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. <clears throat> Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Paul writes, for as often as you drink, eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. As we prepare to do that this morning, we're going to look at a passage in John's first epistle, 1 John chapter 5. This passage addresses a change which has occurred in the life of one who has come to trust in the Lord Jesus. Follow along as I read uh, 1 John chapter 5, the first five verses, 1 through 5. I'm going to be reading from the Legacy Standard Bible because I feel that in this passage it brings out more closely the way the Greek reads than most other translations do. John says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the one who gives new birth loves also the one who has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and do his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. For everything that has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory, or the, the way this reads, the, this is the overcoming that over, has overcome the world, our faith. Who is the one who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This passage begins with the statement that the person who, who believes that Jesus is the Christ, that is, believes that he is the anointed one, the promised Messiah. He has been born of God. The matter of believing in Jesus Christ as the Son of God uh, is the outcome of a supernatural work of God in the life. You might remember that after Peter made the confession that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. In our passage, John is saying that the one believing that Jesus is the, is the Christ is giving evidence that God has brought about a new birth in that person. At the end of chapter 4, verse 1, or in 1 John, rather, at the end of the fourth chapter, uh, the apostle wrote that if anyone says, I love God, and, and he hates his brother, he's a liar. God commanded that the one that loves God should also love his brother. And then in, in 1 John 5, 1, John writes that the one who loves the one who has given new birth also loves the one who has been given new birth. The question at the end of chapter 4 is, can I sincerely say that I love God if I hate my brother? And the answer is no. The question at the end of, at the beginning of chapter five is how do you know that you love your brother? And by the way, the term loving God is synonymous with saying that you're a Christian in the Bible. And he says, how do we know that we love God? It's when we know our brother it's when we love God and keep his commandments and then if we keep his commandments and we, the true love of God makes them so they're not burdensome so keeping the commandments of God 
in love removes the burden of one who is doing things, the right things, but his heart is not in it. When Jesus invited people to take his yoke upon them, he said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The love of God makes all the difference in our lives. It was his love that prompted him to send his son to die for our sins as our substitute. Jesus satisfied God's wrath against our sin and with justice having been met at the cross in his love, he gave us new birth. He also imparted to us saving faith in his son and he poured out his love by his spirit into our hearts so that we love God and we love others who have been born of God. This brings us to another outcome of the new birth. We overcome the world. The world in this context is a system of the world. It's a system that's opposed to God. It's not aligned with God's purposes. And God has planned that his redeemed people live out the rest of their lives in a fallen body and in a world that is opposed to God. You might remember uh, God said to his Old Testament people, that I led you for these 40 years through the wilderness so that I might test you, humble you, and find out what's in your heart, whether you will obey me or not. Our overcoming has both a past and a present. Our, uh, the past tense is in verse 4. It says, this is the overcoming that has overcome the world, our faith. At the point that we came to believe in Jesus Christ, we became overcomers. We partake of the overcoming that Jesus accomplished when he was on the earth, when he was in the flesh. The present tense is in both verse 4 and 5. In verse 4 he says, everything that has been born of God overcomes the world. And then in verse 5 he says, who is the one who overcomes the world, but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? There is a practical sense in which the new birth equips the saint to not succumb to this evil world. As long as we're in the flesh, we're in a battle. And the spirit desires against the flesh, the flesh desires against the spirit. It's by means of the spirit that we put to death the deeds of the flesh. And the one who is born of the Spirit and walks by the Spirit will be able to say with the Apostle Paul at the end of his life, I have fought a good fight. I have kept the faith. And I finished the course. So in the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. So Christian, as you partake of the Lord's Supper, remember that it is the Lord's death that has made all these blessings and benefits possible for you. He gave you new birth, gave you faith in his son, poured out his love into your heart, and that you love God and delight to do his commandments. And you love your fellow believers. Who, and you have both overcome the world and you are overcoming the world. Remember the debt of your sin, which was forgiven by his grace when your heart and when your heart's prepared, you may partake of the communion. If you're here this morning and you know that you not, do not have saving faith in the Lord Jesus, we ask that you please refrain from partaking because this ordinance is for those who have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. But remember and realize that he is the only way you can be saved. You really can do nothing to save yourself and if you would like to visit or talk with somebody about this, look up an elder or you can come to the prayer room to your left at the front of the auditorium after the service and there will be people there to, to pray with you, to talk with you. So men come and serve us at this time.